So, let me introduce you to our first speaker. Um, and in many ways, if you listen to his CV, you wonder, why is he here? Uh, Ian Dunlop has um, had a bit of an insider's insider journey into, uh, into the fossil fuel world. Um, for many years, he was an international staff of Royal Dutch Shell. He's worked in senior levels in oil, gas, and coal exploration and production. Um, he was the chair of the Australian Coal Association in the late 80s. Then he chaired the Australian Greenhouse Office, Office Experts Group on Emissions Trading. And in the late 90s, uh, he was the CEO of the Australian Institute of Com Com Company Directors. So he's, he's kind of traced that journey from, um, uh, from the deep inside the fossil fuel world, going into the world of corporate responsibility and governance, and making those critical decisions about how we move beyond where we are. Um, and so he, he writes extensively on, on governance, climate change, energy and sustainability. And it's a real uh, honour and privilege to, to hear from someone who has got such an intimate knowledge and can tell us how we can get out of this mess. So please make welcome Ian Dunlop. Thanks very much. Is this, this working okay? Yep. Yeah, it is. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak to you this evening um, on what I think is uh, the most critical issue the world currently faces, to be quite honest. And if everything's working, it's basically the fact that if you uh, really want to seriously address climate change, you are going to have to move to a completely different level of action from the one that's been talked about, not just in this country, but globally. And it's not something that's going to get fixed by the UN negotiating process that's currently going on. And I'd just like to really go through why that is the case. So what I'd like to do this evening is talk about firstly the global challenge, which is not the official version you hear. And secondly, to look at what Australia's been doing about it and how that fits within the global framework. And then finally touch on the solutions end of it as to how we can move forward and get out of the, I think as Craig said, the sort of mess we're currently in. So that's what I'll go through um, fairly quickly. Uh, we can sort of then have a bit of a chat about that at the end and the panels and so on, I think. So looking at the global picture, um, what's happening at the moment is that climate change is moving far faster than anybody's prepared to actually admit officially. If you look at the decadal picture that NASA puts up over the last, uh, well, the decade since 1900, you can see the sort of picture here and the darker colours of warming. So it's pretty clear, you've got a very good visual impression from this, is that we're seeing massive changes in terms of global temperature increase. And the critically important issue is that the biggest changes are occurring at the poles, two or three times faster than anything that's happening uh, anywhere else in the world. And that has absolutely fundamental implications for the way we actually handle this. The big issue is that the world is now approaching what the scientists call climate tipping points. Climate change doesn't just proceed in a linear, steady fashion over the years. You, you get positive feedback loops developing in the system, to use engineering terms where the climate will probably jump from one relatively stable state to another one which is much less conducive to human development. The classic example, uh, for example, is the Arctic with the sea ice. The white sort of cap on the, the North Pole, for example, solar radiation comes in and gets reflected off the ice back into space. And so the water beneath the ice stays relatively cool. If that ice starts melting, then what happens is that the sea colour as the ice reduces absorbs much more solar radiation than was previously the case. The waters heat up. That in turn melts the permafrost around the Arctic. It leads then to further emissions of methane and carbon dioxide from that permafrost. That in turn speeds up the, uh, the rate of warming. And so the whole thing gets into a positive, positive feedback loop and the acceleration in warming then takes place, and that's what we've been seeing. This picture gives an indication of the types of um, tipping points that we have around the world. I talked about the sea ice and the Arctic. You're seeing the same sort of thing with the Greenland ice sheet. 
uh, in, in the Antarctica you see uh, in the West Antarctic ice sheet um, a similar problem, but it's occurring with slightly different mechanism because the ocean waters are warming in the Southern Ocean. And it's coming up underneath the Antarctic ice sheet and actually melting it from below, which is why we're now starting to see a uh, great deal of concern about the uh, ice sheets breaking off from the main Antarctic uh, mainland and forming uh, excessive sort of carving of icebergs. And as it, all of this occurs, of course, it's going to significantly add to the increase in sea level rise, which uh, has been talked about now as something that by, say, the end of the century, we were talking about maybe half a metre of sea level increase. The most recent estimate from uh, US experts that is it might be two and a half metres. A two and a half metre sea level increase makes an absolutely fundamental difference around the world to all sorts of <coughs> countries and cities, which I'll come back to. So you see that sort of problem occurring in the Amazon rainforest, for example. It's one of the world's big carbon sinks. So the rainforest absorbs carbon and obviously then reduces its sort of atmospheric concentration. Now the droughts that have been occurring in um, the Amazon over the last few years are now starting to turn their periods of the year into a carbon source instead of a sink. So in, rather than absorbing the carbon, it pushes it into the atmosphere, which in turn speeds up the um, <coughs> essentially the warming process. The other big issue that's changing is as the Arctic, uh, the pole temperatures um, increase, the, different, the, the differential between the poles and the equator is reducing. And so the jet stream picture that has uh, circled the world for eons, I guess, is now changing. It's becoming a much uh, steeper oscillation amplitude. And that means you get weather patterns getting stuck in ways they previously didn't. For example, in, in North America in recent time, there have been extended periods on, say, the west coast of the US, where you've had absolutely static jet stream pictures which keep the temperatures extremely high in places like California. And that's been one of the reasons we've seen these very uh, extensive bushfires in California in recent time. If you add that in with the fact that warming temperatures have led to an infestation of pine bark beetle right through the Rockies, so large areas of their forests are actually dead, you've actually got a tinderbox. And that's what's been happening in California through the course of this year. You then see, of course, the uh, extremes in hurricane events that um, you know, we've seen quite unprecedented uh, Atlantic hurricane season this year with um, I think the four hurricanes, you know, the one that initially hit um, Texas and then the three subsequent ones have been going on. So we're seeing massive changes in the way the world's climatic system actually operates. And these are all, uh, you can't sort of say that this is all due to climate change. But there's no question that the fact that we have a warming world, we have increased moisture content in the atmosphere and so on, is all making these changes far more extreme than was previously the case. So climate change is a big factor in this, and the more we let it go on, the more extreme these events are going to become. So these are the big problem areas which uh, you know, the scientists have been concerned about, that once you move into a number of these areas and we trigger some of them, they basically become irreversible. There's no way of going back with any human time, within any human time frame. So the critical issue is we try and stop it before it occurs. Um, so we see these things starting to happen, and the, the, one of the problems is they're not incorporated into the current uh, Intergovernmental <coughs> Panel on Climate Change analysis. Because uh, in many cases, we just don't know enough about it. We don't know how fast this stuff is going to occur. And all of the indications are that it's going to occur actually rather more quickly than we expected. So there are some big uh, gaps in our scientific understanding. And it points to the fact you really have to distinguish, in my view, between science and risk. In engineering terms, it's fairly common that you, you do that. But I mean, the, the basic science takes you so far. Then you have to use common sense and saying, well, what are the risk implications of this? 
and what should you do to um, you know, provide for circumstances where the result may be much less um, happy than you might think. We should be preparing for the worst and, and be thankful that it actually doesn't occur. But we're not doing that. We're assuming that somehow the average IPCC view is actually satisfactory for planning purposes. And I'll explain a little bit what that actually means. If you look at the um, Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement, well, sorry, first, the, the blue line on this graph is actually global temperature back over the last 20,000 years. So you can see the temperature increased um, initially over the first 10,000 years of this period. And then it, we entered this so-called geological Holocene period, which is over the last 10,000 years, which is pretty much when humanity as we know it really developed. And the temperature in that period is relatively stable. It fluctuates a bit, but you can see it's pretty stable. When you come to the right-hand side of the graph, what we're now seeing is because, particularly since World War II, where we've been pushing carbon into the atmosphere at a rate which is 10 times greater than occurred in the previous um, uh, uh, discontinuities when carbon dioxide levels went up very rapidly. You can see this jump of the temperature, the temperature suddenly going up. The lines here to the right are the uh, IPCC scenarios of what they think uh, must happen. The top one is business as usual. The bottom one is keeping to roughly two degrees C and others in between. So uh, that's the range of where we might possibly go to. Now the Paris Agreement that was entered into at the end of 2015 says that we, the world should aim to keep the temperature well below two degrees C and ideally toward one and a half. And that's the gray band, uh, sorry, that's relative to pre-industrial levels. That's the gray band we see across here. And if you then superimpose the best scientific assessment of where those tipping points might come from, these uh, uh, yellow and orange bars here represent the um, extent of the probability distribution of the risk of when those tipping points come in. So for example, if you come right to the left hand side, WAS is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And you can see that the risk of that actually tipping point occurring starts below 2 degrees C. In fact, um, a number of scientists consider that that is now an irreversible melt. And we can't stop it. But the risk increases, as temperature increases, so the risk gets higher up to the, the dark area at the top. So that seems to be starting to have uh, been triggered already. If you then come on to the next land, the Greenland ice sheet, you can see that's occurring also over the Paris framework. And then the Antarctic summer sea ice, um, it's already been reduced substantially since 79. Uh, we've lost about I think for about 75% of it in summer. And so on, the alpine glaciers, uh, coral reefs, the Great Barrier Reef is part of that, and a large part of it is already dead. Um, many would argue that even at uh, the current temperature increase, which is about 1.2 degrees C relative to the genuine pre-industrial level, the Barrier Reef is probably now finished. We can't stop it decline because of the repeated um, bleachings that will go on from now on as sea surface temperature <coughs> has actually increased. You've then got other ones which are higher up in the temperature range, the Amazon rainforest right the way through to permafrost here on the right and Arctic winter sea ice. The problem with some of those, we just really don't have enough information to tell exactly when it's happening. Permafrost for example, if you look around the Arctic at the moment, there are um, quite clear indications that we're getting very big changes occurring in the uh, for East Siberian Arctic Shelf, for example. You're finding areas along the Siberian mainland where you're getting gas blowouts, little bubbles come up in the permafrost and blow out. The Russians first discovered this about three years ago. And they form craters about 60 meters wide. I mean, it's quite it's not a small thing. I'm just sort of, it's a big eruption, more or less. 
So the problem is that this keeps escalating. We're going to end up with you know, increasing amounts of methane being blown out of the permafrost, which in turn leads to an acceleration in the, in the rate of melt. And so on. So these are the problems that we're now getting into, which you don't hear talked about in the you know day-to-day -day conversations about climate change. Okay, so that's the tipping point problem, and the concern now is that by what we've done already, these things are happening. And if we don't start to move much more quickly, there's no going back. It'll just keep on happening. And you'll find an acceleration in, in temperature increases and sea level increase and so on that we lose the ability to influence from humanity's point of view. So the question is, you know, how much time have you really got to actually address this problem? If you look at the Paris Agreement, um, to summarize it, it looks something like this. We've seen warming already since pre-industrial levels of one degree C. The Paris Upper Lent Agreement said that we have to limit temperature to well below two degrees C and ideally toward one and a half. At the moment, that's the Paris objective, but the um, so-called independently determined national contributions, in other words, what each country is going to contribute and what they commit they committed to voluntarily at Paris, is leading us to a world of three degrees C. It's not getting anywhere near the actual objective of Paris. Now, that's what they committed to do. The path we're currently on is actually leading us to about four degrees C. So if we manage to, um, everybody actually does the right thing and commits to the Paris outcome, then we'd be three, but at the moment we're on a path to four. And there's no sign that we're actually moving fast enough to get off that four degree path. So what does all that mean? Well, if you look at the one degree C, we're already seeing the Arctic sea ice melt. We're seeing the West Antarctic ice sheet probably past the tipping point. At two degrees C, the scientific world considered two degrees C originally to be the, the boundary of dangerous climate change. And the view was um, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that two degrees C was the limit we should not exceed. Now, there wasn't actually any great scientific validity to that. It was more a matter of saying, well, look, we think we can achieve that. And therefore, that was the target we actually took. What now turns out is because of the evidence we've seen since, is that this is now the, day of the boundary of extremely dangerous climate change. We certainly shouldn't go above it, and we really should be aiming to stay well below. The three degrees C path that uh, Paris commitments have us, would have us on, in the view of many experts, is, is outright social chaos around the world because of the implications of things like sea level increase, temperature increase, weather extremes, health factors becoming more and more problematic. Um, you have large numbers of people having to move because of uh, encroachment on major cities around Asia and Europe and so on. And uh, a major problem, I think, for global governments as to how you're going to manage that process. Four degrees C is considered to be incompatible with an organized global community. There are just going to be so many major changes occurring that the whole idea of the global community as we know it would be completely disrupted. Now that's what we're really looking at. But we don't hear it talked about in those terms. I mean, you know, people seem to think that, okay, three or four degrees C, uh, fine, we can somehow work our way through that. I mean, John Howard's famous uh, comment from a long time ago about, you know, doesn't seem a big temperature increase, you just take your sweater off. Well, I mean, that's the attitude that still exists, unfortunately. In, uh, in uh, many of our leadership uh, positions, <coughs> the head of Santos, uh, Peter Copes, I think the AGM this year, um, expressed the opinion that the planning they were doing for uh, their future sort of operations was based on the idea of a four degree C world, which was perfectly satisfactory from the point of view of a planning, you know, a future sort of um, environment we'd be operating in. He has absolutely no idea what that means. 
And sadly, the understanding, I think, among senior people in both politics, the corporate world, and um, in many other parts of society, is frankly a business. Because the people do not understand this. And a large part of the reason is that we've never really had the honest conversation about climate change that should be taking place. So what this means is that we are actually on a path to an existential crisis unless we find a way of reversing this whole process pretty quickly. If you look at um, the implications of Paris in a slightly different way, uh, this is a picture of the emissions globally that we've seen the uh, grey line to the, to the left hand side here, um, historically. And then you say, well, what do we have to do to basically achieve the Paris objective, say, 2 degrees C? Well, if you can peak the emissions globally, say by about now, this is 2016, but say 2017, then you come down on this light blue line. So it's a pretty steep reduction globally, and, but it, it then smooths off to zero emissions by about 2040. If you leave that until 2020, you follow the yellow line, which is a steeper reduction. And if you leave it till 2025, to meet that objective, you have to virtually drop off a cliff. In other words, we have to tomorrow morning just stop everything, end of story, in terms of fossil fuel emissions. So what we're doing by leaving this process until the last possible minute is we're just locking ourselves in, into a completely impossible position in terms of solving the, the climate problem. Now, if you look at what's happening at the moment, business as usual is the red line here. It's, it's continuing to go up. To meet Paris, we have to see emissions now level off and drop very quickly. Um, even if you take the Paris commitments, it's the orange line, which doesn't show any reduction in emissions right up until 2030. So we're just way off beam in terms of where, the, um, you know, where we, we now have to move to. So there's really a yawning chasm between uh, Paris and uh, the rhetoric and the reality we, we now have to follow. The problem, the bigger problem, is that the uh, climate forcing, while we should see those emissions reducing, is actually going up. Um, this is a picture which is not just CO2, uh, that's the, the light blue color here, but added in is the other greenhouse gases. So you see uh, methane is the dark blue color, nitrous oxide is the green, and then the red area is the uh, Montreal Protocol, Protocol trace gases um, and other trace gases. Now, this picture is good and bad news. If you look at the current position, you can see that um, the emissions in total are accelerating when you add it all in. CO2 in some senses has dropped a little bit, but the others are going up. And we've got to come down on this sort of uh, lower line here, basically. So that's the bad news. The good news is, if you look further back, this is the period of the Montreal Protocol. And you can see that when humanity does actually get its act together and agree that we're going to stop doing these things, it actually has been quite effective. So, I mean, this is when the CFCs and so on, the trace gases were growing. The world got its act together around here, and bingo, it all dropped. The problem today, of course, is that the, um, the climate change issue is a much bigger one than just trace gases <coughs> from CFCs, because uh, the CFCs were something that was contained within the refrigerant uh, in a business community, it was relatively controllable. Uh, whereas, obviously, you know, carbon dioxide and methane and so on is a much, much bigger problem globally. So it can be done, um, but it needs an understanding of the fact that uh, the problem is very different from the one we're being told about officially. Now, how do we stay below the Paris limits? Well, this is a picture, I'm sorry this is rather small, but the, something's missing. Okay, this uh, set of circles here represent the fossil fuel 
of reserves and resources in the world. The big circle, the ochre one, is the resources we know we've got of fossil fuels. That's not uh, what we can necessarily produce, but we know that that is there under certain economic conditions. The central circle are actually reserves that we know we can produce at uh, current, with current technology and current costs. And then the inner circle, the darker red, are the developed reserves. That's what we're currently producing from in our coal mines, our oil and gas operations, and so on. And so you move from resources to reserves to developed reserves in the classification and the way in which uh, you know, mining actually works. Now, if you look at what you have to do to stay below 2 degrees C, if you just take purely the developed component of this, not the resources or the reserves, just the bit we're currently developing, we're, we're operating, and you translate all of those into um, emissions of carbon, then you get this picture here, and you can see the components of coal, oil and gas and so on right the way up to the top here. And if you then look at the budget to stay below 2 degrees C, uh, it's the, this one here. So you can see that um, if you take the top of that budget, we can only produce about 80%, shall we say, of the total developed reserves in the world today. So that means that 20% of the existing operation is going to have to be shut in. So they become stranded assets. You can't keep producing them if you want to stay below 2 degrees C. If you want to stay below 1.5 degrees C, then the limit drops. And you can only produce, say, around 35-40% of the existing operations in the world. So, you know, just on average, 40% of our coal mines can continue, 60% have to shut in before the end of their um, <coughs> normal asset market. The problem with that, however, is that the way this has worked is that the argument is to have a 50% chance of meeting two degree, uh, one and a half degrees C is that uh, budget there. And for two degrees C, it's 66% or two thirds chance. Now, I mean, I'm an engineer, and you don't go out and build a bridge with a 50-50 chance of it falling down. I mean, you don't get on a plane to fly to Melbourne with a 50-50 chance of getting there. You'd be put in jail for doing things like that. So why is it that we're prepared to do this with the future of humanity? Because that's what we're talking about. I mean, if we don't solve climate change, if you end up with, say, a 4 degrees C temperature increase, the implication of that is we're probably going to see a reduction in global population from around 7.5 billion today to possibly one. That's what the science is telling us from the combined effects of uh, the extremes which um, that type of temperature increase will bring. So that's what we're playing with, but nobody wants to talk about it in those terms. We all pretend that the UN process that goes on year after year after year is somehow going to deliver the outcome we want. We've been doing it for 25 years now, and basically it's not delivering anything. Now, that 50 or 60 percent is not good odds for humanity, as I've said. If you look at it another way and say, well, okay, what are sensible odds? Well, this is the probability distribution function for the, the, the chance of keeping below 2 degrees C. So in other words, um, as you go from zero chance of low 2 degrees C up to, say, 100%, then you're, that's the budget you have, and this is the blue line. Now, what that means is if you say, well, um, essentially the temperature increase is a function of cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. Now, we've put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution this gray bar, just over 500, 600, um, <laughs> gigatons of carbon, essentially. So if you say, well, I prepare to accept a one-third chance of staying below 2 degrees C, then you go to the or, or probability of success, either 30%. That gives you the total budget. 
You've already emitted the grey bar, so the remaining budget you can put into the atmosphere is this green line here. If you say, well, that's not really very good, I want better odds than that, so 50%, your budget goes down. Two-thirds chance you have a smaller budget again. And if you say, well, look, what's realistic? Oops, not church for me. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Uh, the screen's still working. Um, if you say, well, you know, what's sensible? I mean, basically, you want, uh, say, at least in engineering terms, you'd be aiming for, say, a 99% chance of success. But just take 90%. Then, at 90%, you actually have no budget left today. So, that means that we should, tomorrow morning, stop the use of all fossil fuels. Now, we're not going to do that, of course, because the inertia in the system is so great uh, that it's impossible. But that fact should be reflected in the urgency with which we address this problem. And it's not there. We're assuming that somehow we can build the Adani mine and it'll go on for its 40 or 60 years or whatever it is and all will be well. That uh, you know, Australia will reap the benefits of all of that, that uh, we will gradually find ways of reducing our emissions and uh, in the long run everything will work out. Unfortunately, that's not what the science is telling us at all. And we do have this problem that um, the scientific community have tended to underestimate the risks. This is the view of Nicholas Stern, who wrote the Stern Report in uh, 2006, is that you know, the, the latest IPCC report is essentially reporting on a body of literature that systemically and grossly underrated, underestimated the risks of unmanaged climate change. Ross Garner made the same point in the Garner Review in 20, 2009 and 2011. Uh, you can't necessarily blame the, the, the scientists for this because they tend not to want to say things they can't support. And a lot of this stuff is extremely complex and we just don't have enough information. But it brings you back to the fact that you really have to think about risk as opposed to science and look at the you know, precautionary implications of, of the risk in the way you actually handle this. What does existential actually mean? Well, this is one way of looking at risk. Um, on the one hand, you look at the intensity of risk. It's either endurable or it's terminal. And on the other, you look at the scope, which could be personal, local, or global. So for example, I mean, if your car is stolen, it's personal, it's endurable, you can get another one, you have insurance, hopefully. Um, essentially, if you have a death in the family or something, it's terminal, it's personal. Climate change is up in the top right-hand box. It's basically global and it's terminal. If we don't get this right, then everything else becomes fairly academic because you're not going to have an environment in which humanity can actually progress in the way that we have uh, been accustomed to thinking about it. It means that essentially what that risk represents is a permanent large negative consequence to humanity which we can never undo. It's an adverse outcome that would either annihilate intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. Now that's what we're dealing with. But do you see this in our discussion Domestically, Do you see it in the IPCC discussions? Not at all. It doesn't get mentioned. But we should be talking about it, not in the sense of alarmism, but in the sense that unless you recognise the risk, you could never solve the problem. And it's not easy, because as Nick Bostrom, who's um, an Oxford professor who specialises in these areas, says it's extremely hard to actually get your mind around this stuff and to articulate it honestly and openly in the way in which we, we go about uh, you know, the discussions around these issues. But that is the reality, and it's something we really need to initiate a discussion on. And that risk is actually immediate. It's not something that is going to be 10 or 20 years down the line. And why? Well, first, there is no carbon budget left today, if you take a realistic chance of, of handling the problem. Second, the actions we take today are basically locking in 
existential outcomes. Um, one of the biggest problems with climate change is that the emissions we put into the atmosphere now, you don't see the full effects of for 20 or 30 years' time. The, uh, the events we're seeing today, the extreme events, uh, are because of emissions we put into the atmosphere 20 years ago, which are gradually accumulating, because there's a big inertia in the global climate system, which means that they don't come through fully. I mean, if you look at the bulk of the heat that's coming in from space, at the moment about 93% of it is absorbed in the oceans, and it takes a long time for the oceans to actually heat up. That's now starting to be evident in the way that ocean surface temperatures are increasing, the way that the uh, Antarctic um, is getting undercut, essentially by um, the warmer water going up underneath the ice sheets. All of these sort of things are happening. So we're gradually starting to see all these changes, and that's where the tipping point issues really come in. So if we go ahead and build more coal mines, more oil and gas operations, coal seam gas and so on. All we're doing is locking in stuff we can never get away from. And those investments made today are making it impossible for us to solve the climate change problem. Which is why things like Adani cannot be allowed to go ahead. Because if it does, you can forget about climate change. It's not just the Dani, there are another nine mines in that same Galilee Basin. I'll come back to that shortly. Now, if you're looking at this from a risk management point of view, I mean, sensible risk management addresses risk before things happen, so you can prevent it. And basically, that time is now. It's not 20 years' time and so on. Uh, the, the, the approach that's implicit in the whole of our government negotiations around climate energy policy is you can put everything off for another 10 or 20 years and all will be well. Um, so to solve this, you've got to move to a completely different sort of response from the one we're using. Uh, it has to be an emergency response because the market solutions and normal regulatory approaches are not going to solve this. We have to have something different. We have to move to something like uh, the actions that were taken in the lead into World War II, where economies were turned on their head in no time flat, in the space of six to nine months. The economies in the UK and Germany and the US were completely reorganized to address the threat that was then uh, perceived, which was obviously much clearer, much more real in a sense than we're seeing with climate change, which is rather diffuse, but on the other hand, you know, we've had the, the probably the world's greatest scientific investigation we've ever seen looking at climate, and we still are not prepared to get our minds around the fact that um, what the science is telling us is real. What happens in the, if you look at the solutions um, and you compare it with what we're doing in this country, this is a picture of the um, International Energy Agency's view on the future of the coal industry. And the IEA, I should say, is not exactly totally on board with the climate science. But even with the IEA showing that the, the gray bar here, which is coal, is basically going to be gone by 2040. Unless you have carbon capture and storage, uh, none of which is basically working at the present time. So, you know, the official view from the IEA is that you cannot continue coal in the way that our government is claiming we, we, we should be doing. The problem, of course, is that we are seeing rapid expansion of renewable energy, which is all extremely encouraging and absolutely essential. But the challenge is that we're moving from a point where today we still depend on fossil fuel for about 86% of... Um, our energy supply, 85%. Um, and the renewable component, apart from hydro, is only about 3.8%. So in 20 years, we have to completely reverse that. And this is a, the level of change we have never, ever seen in human history. So it's going to require a massive effort to get on top of the problem uh, in a way that meets the, you know, the, the speed of change that's needed. The problem, of course, is that 
despite all the rhetoric and the noise that this is important, we have to fix it, the G20 countries are still subsidizing fossil fuels vastly more than renewables. And the biggest subsidy is that we don't have a price on carbon. In other words, we allow carbon to be emitted, we allow the warming implications of that to occur, the health implications to occur, <coughs> and because we don't price those things, it's a massive subsidy. If you price coal properly, <coughs> you would increase the cost by 60%, according to the International Monetary Fund. Now, that means the entire relativity of energy supply in this country would be dramatically changed, and things would get fixed. But because we have a government that is not prepared uh, either, either, either the, um, the coalition or the Labour Party to seriously price carbon. We get into this nonsensical policy argument about finding other ways to do things which are completely inefficient and ineffective. So quickly, let's have a look at Australia. Well, I mean, we have one of the world's best endowment of energy resources, both fossil fuel uranium and renewable. I won't go in, into all of this, but we've got all these coal basins, oil and gas and so on, uh, renewable resources right through the country. So we are probably better placed than anybody else to actually benefit from the transition to a low carbon economy. We've been better placed than most others to benefit from the fossil fuel economy. But if we don't start changing, other people are not going to be terribly happy. If we have all this stuff sitting there and we're not using it. So in ge geopolitical terms, this is building up to be a very big problem as the rest of the world starts to realize the implications of climate change. We're sitting there with all of this potential and not using it. So if you're worried about stop the boats and things of that kind, this is a much, much bigger problem. So let's look at our <coughs> climate energy politics. We've got a, a highly influential fossil fuel industry which has grown up over 40 years, which is, um, has far more influence than it really should be at this point in time. We had a conservative government from the beginnings of the serious climate uh, action from the Kyoto Protocol to 2007. Signed Kyoto but never, never uh, ratified it because George W. Bush decided not to go into the Kyoto Protocol. It backed off carbon's pricing and emissions trading uh, because of that. The Labour government then ratified Kyoto, um, got coal feed after Copenhagen, and then we had the late leadership crisis around climate issues. And then we've had, of course, the chaos ever since, um, with the domination of climate denialists within government, removing carbon pricing whilst claiming we we're going to be serious about addressing the problem, ratifying Paris, but highly inadequate commitments, and uh, really a completely dysfunctional climate and energy policy that has occurred ever since. And I think the latest uh, national energy guarantee is frankly the really scraping the bottom of the barrel. I mean, you can't go much lower than coming up with something that nobody's actually thought through. Nobody knows what the hell it actually means. And it's certainly doing nothing to address the problem we've actually got. So that um, guarantee is supposedly going to give us reliable, affordable energy, which meets our Paris commitments. What we've really got is we have removed the subsidies on renewables. We're pro-coal and, and coal seam gas. Uh, we're extending the life of existing power stations. Um, we don't believe renewables are acceptable, either reliable or affordable. Adamantly opposed to carbon pricing. And unlikely, well, I said unlikely, it's impossible to meet our Paris commitments uh, in, in what's being proposed. So it is utter nonsense um, to say we're serious about uh, doing any of this stuff, and I mean, it demonstrates I think the power of the fossil fuel lobby in this country. So, <clears throat> the the key issues then, uh, just to go through some of the points in relation to the size of the problem. I mean, clean coal um, is not clean; it's an oxymoron. It drops emissions by about 30% relative to 
the normal um, level of emissions from a conventional power station, which is a help, but it doesn't solve the problem if you have enough carbon budget. Carbon capture and storage, uh, we've spent millions on research, and there is no major project working anywhere in the world apart from those that are re-injecting carbon into oil and gas reservoirs. And that's not new. That's been done since the 70s. I was doing it in the North Sea in the 1970s myself as a young engineer. Um, but doing it away from existing oil and gas reservoirs is a completely different issue. And it's much more expensive, much harder. And it's not working, even though everybody's saying this has to be the way of solving our Paris problems. The uh, <coughs> Healy coal fired power stations, um, again, they reduce emissions relative to the earlier ones, but they don't solve the problem because you still have you know, relatively high emission levels coming from them. And the argument that we should be putting them into North Queensland, for example, is utter nonsense. I mean, it's based on the idea that somehow Paris, um, sorry, somehow you know, the rest of Asia is doing this, and therefore we should be allowed to do the same. Now, China and India are actually putting a lot of these things in, but they're getting rid of older power stations, and they've been putting these power stations in <coughs> for some years now. But they're now cutting back on this as well, because they realise that they can't sustain it. And if you go to Delhi at the moment, you see um, probably some of the worst pollution the world has ever seen. It was Beijing, Delhi is now the, the pollution centre of the world. And everybody is now backtracking very quickly on these things, so why we want to put them into northern Australia is uh, beyond me. Um, what's more, they're far more expensive now than renewables. If you look at gas, you get gas from a number of different areas, LNG, coal steam gas, type gas, shale gas. Um, LNG may be, Northwest Shell for example, a conventional gas reservoir, may be a partial solution temporarily to our problem because those reservoirs are very contained. But coal seam gas certainly is not, because the leakage rates, if it's much above 3% leakage to atmosphere, um, then it's worse than using coal, because methane has much uh, higher warming potential than, than CO2 has. And most of the evidence from the US and um, I think from Australia indicates that the leakage rates are probably somewhere in the 7 to 15% range. Um, and the same risks apply in tight gas and shale gas. So gas is by no means a solution to our problems. Renewables, of course, the cost is coming down. The reliability is going up. You have to have storage and various things. So that is a plus point, but it's coming off a very low base. Nuclear, my own personal view is we can't afford to ignore it. Not the old nuclear, but the newer technologies coming in, which are smaller scale and fail safe. Um, if it's proven to work uh, because of the size of the problem. Now, the Chinese are doing a lot of work on this at the moment and some parts of the US actually the same. So I think you have to be sceptical but you can't just write it off if the technology actually works. And then of course you have export coal um, and dying. So 20 years of failure to address climate change policy has seriously have really resulted in rapidly rising energy prices in this country and a complete disconnect between our real climate challenge and the types of policy we're putting in place. If you look at Adani just um, quickly, the problem is quite simply this. That's a picture of where coal consumption has gone over the last 40 odd years. And the big issue is that China, from 2000 to 2012, roughly doubled its coal consumption from uh, 2 to 4 billion tons a year. Now, by doing that, the Chinese have probably put the world above 2 degrees C. They now realize that they have to reverse that, so they're, they're working extremely fast to turn that around. But the big problem is that India, which is the orange one here, were to follow the Chinese path then we're on an absolutely suicidal path globally. So somehow India has to be convinced not to do that. And uh, <coughs> a lot is going on. I think the Indians are now moving very quickly into renewable energy. 
not least because of the same pollution problem that forced China to change as well. But if a dining gets built and the uh, development of coal sort of moves in the way that uh, the Adani story goes, then frankly we're all toast. And just to look at the Adani, I mean that's the mine superimposed on Sydney. It's about 60 kilometers long roughly. <clears throat> and once you open up the Gallery Basin, then there's another probably eight mines there of the same size, which the likes of Gina Reinhardt and uh, Clive Palmer and others have got fingers in. And that becomes another major coal province. And of course, if you listen to uh, our good Senator Matt Canavan, you want to build a coal-fired power station and use it to expand the use of uh, you know, the development of Northern Australia. Well, I mean, what, what people don't seem to realise is that if climate change takes off, the impact on Northern Australia is going to be severe. And it's, you know, the idea that somehow you're going to be an provide an economic bonanza to Northern Australia by developing coal is just utter nonsense. So why is this all happening? Well, um, the global financial crisis in 2008 is a bit of an analogy. Um, when that occurred, the Queen was at the London School of Economics, and she said, well, why did nobody foresee the time and extent and severity of the global financial crisis? And then she had all of the best economists in the UK assembled. They came back about a year later and formally said, look, a psychology of denial gripped the financial and corporate world, the failure of the collective imagination of many bright people to understand the risks to the system as a whole. And that's the problem we now have with climate change, is that there is a systemic risk in the system which nobody wants to talk about. We're all going round and round it, pretending this can get fixed by the UN negotiations and so on, but the problem is not the one that the official world is talking about. And so we're repeating the same uh, problem that occurred during the, the GFC. Nick Gowing and a colleague have done a, um, a lot of work recently. This is a, a fellow who used to be one of the senior commentators in the BBC. Looking at the problem that increasingly around the world there is a concern that the really big issues are not getting addressed by our leaders. And what they, um, they produced a report called Thinking the Unthinkable, which is quite interesting reading if you uh, are into that sort of thing. But it says, you know, what, what we're seeing is a new fragility at the highest level of corporate and public service leadership. The ability to spot, identify, and handle unexpected, non-normative events is, is inadequate at critical moments. A deep reluctance, or what call, might be called executive myopia, to see and contemplate even the possibility that unthinkables might happen. And climate change is a classic example of this, where nobody at the senior leadership level is engaging with what the problem really is. And what does that mean? Well, I mean, you've got um, the famous black swan issue that uh, <coughs> Marilyn Taleb, I think, talked about. You know, random, highly improbable, unknown unknowns, um, earthquakes, new diseases, lone wolf assassinations, and so on. So we know about black swans, but the other thing is black elephants. These are things that are knowable, they're imaginable, um, they're unpalatable. Things like the GFC, the, Iraq, the consequences of the Iraq war, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and global warming. You know, we know this is happening, but we don't want to talk about it. So if you try and excuse black elephants as black swans, this is a massive failure of imagination. We know this stuff is there. There's no point pretending that nobody knew it. Um, but that's what we're actually doing. And you can see it in the way, say, the oil industry is actually looking at this problem. I mean, you, you listen to the Shells, the BPs, the Exxon, the BHP. They all say, yes, yes, this is terribly serious. We must address climate change. We're all committed to staying below 2 degrees C. If you then look at what the, they put out in terms of their scenario picture and the way the world will work, then this is what you see. The, the red line area here is the pathway to stay below 1.5 degrees C. This is um, time versus uh, emissions. The blue is the 2 degrees C line. But the, the scenarios the oil companies are putting out 
are the ones at the top, which is heading for 3 or 4 degrees C. And that's what they're planning on, whilst telling everybody that we're committed to solving climate problem. So that in itself is a failure of imagination. As, you know, the Financial Times in London said last year, I mean, the oil companies have not yet reconciled themselves to the meaning of the Paris Agreement. I mean, this is not, this is, you know, the, the, the London Financial Times is not exactly your sort of left-wing green organisation. And it's been extremely critical of what's been going on in that sense. So the reasons for that sort of failure, I mean, uh, you get this group think where nobody wants to speak out of turn in terms of what the problem really is. Um, silos, people not cooperating, which we've seen in the 9-11 problem. Um, executive short-termism, um, and so on. And I won't go through all of them, but basically you end up with this sort of reluctance to really focus on anything which is outside the conventional box. So the big question we have then is who at the highest level of leadership in the corporate public service will take the bold risks required, not gradually or incrementally, but decisively, uh, to address these issues? And that's what we're not seeing. We're not seeing leadership in that sense, either here or elsewhere in the world. So very quickly then, what's the solutions framework in these things? Well, um, these are the things I'm working with at the moment, which is you've got to have an honest um, articulation of the risks and opportunities. You've got to change the context of the debate from incremental change to really emergency type approach. We need coalitions of champions who are prepared to commit and speak out on these issues. And it's not going to come from conventional politics. It's too hard for the conventional system to handle this. So you need uh, community groups, certainly activist groups, um, progressive companies, and they, they are around. Um, the military, who are well aware of these problems, uh, particularly in the US, for example, where the military have basically been told to ignore Trump and keep on planning for climate change. Um, you have governments where they are prepared to um, be progressive, international institutions, and the other big thing is the investment community and insurance companies and so on. Now there's a big change is occurring there at the moment because these groups are starting to realise that unless they solve this problem, uh, they don't have a future. And these are organisations that have a responsibility to look 20 or 30 years out in maintaining the returns of you know, your and my superannuation fund and so on. But directors have a personal responsibility uh, to look after those returns. And if they don't do it, they become legally liable. I'll come back to that question. So you've got to expand that emergency movement. You've got to start talking about the um, critical policy outcomes in the sense of saying, we're here today, we've got to get there tomorrow, how do we do it? not what's politically realistic in the way that we tend to um, focus the issue. The national security dimensions have become extremely important in the way this operates, and things like fossil fuel subsidies and the rest. And I think in the interest of the common good, this sort of issue really has to be set outside conventional politics. The immediate leverage point is actually corporate governance because we're seeing quite big changes. Um, you're already seeing companies having to start writing down assets because they don't think they're going to be able to actually continue to produce them. Um, you can see the risks accelerating. Directors are now starting to realize that they have got to start thinking about the personal liability they have in this context. And uh, there are legal opinions now coming out that climate change is an absolutely essential component of the director's responsibility. We're seeing major campaigns for divestment, which has been very successful in many ways in this country, and it's accelerating around the world at the moment, of getting people to get out of fossil fuels. And you can see the um, Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is the biggest in the world, took a decision last week, actually, to withdraw from fossil fuels. Um, and to diversify its base. You're seeing increasing resolutions at annual general meetings asking companies now to 
articulate how they are going to manage a two degree C world. It's not quite yet where it's got to be because companies are still being asked to say what would happen if governments introduce legislation. That's not really the right question. The right question is, what are you going to do as a company to achieve a two degree C world? And that's a different, different issue. But it's getting there. And you're starting to see legal action being taken against um, recalcitrant companies and directors, which is now starting to, to mount up. And then finally, increased regulation. The Bank of England have now brought in um, a requirement, it's voluntary at the moment, that companies on the London and New York Stock Exchanges have to now disclose their carbon risk. Uh, and that will become increasingly onerous, I think, on companies. And um, APRA in Australia has now started to uh, ask for the same thing. So all of this is moving, but it's not moving anywhere near fast enough, unfortunately. So just to summarise, I mean, what we are is a classic example of the dangers of climate denialism. Um, it's particularly dangerous for us because of one of the hottest and driest countries, uh, continents on Earth, and we're most exposed to the impact of climate change. Um, the economic cost to us is already substantial, and to countries like the US, for example, where the damages this year from the hurricane season are going to be enormous. And you can really see that in the results of insurance companies around the world, actually. We're not going to get political leadership on this, given the really the corrosive nature of the debate. And um, so, really, we need community, business, and media to fill that vacuum. And that's the role I think we all have, is to up the ante on these things and start to uh, start a different sort of conversation to really focus on what the, the real problem is. So thank you very much. And, uh, just a couple of references. There are three reports that David Spratt and I have produced in recent time which summarise all of this, if anybody's interested. They're all available on the web. Great. And what you do tomorrow morning, sign a climate emergency petition. Thank you very much. <laughs> and they're all on the table. <laughs> um, thank you, Ian. It's um, uh, profound and sobering. Um, I think the two words jumped to my head.